Hello and welcome to Motoring Monstrosities. This is a new series I'm trialling, a companion series to Car Retrospective. However, unlike that series, we don't take a deep dive into the history of some of the car community's favourite items, rather we look at some of the worst motors the industry has to offer and go over why they are so, so terrible. So, to start all of this off, I thought a great place to go would be the turbulent and overall pretty terrible world of British Leyland, and one of their most infamous offerings, the Austin Allegro. So why did it suck so much? So the question is, what happens when you combine two awful concepts into one, British Leyland and the Malays era? Well, you get this. The Malays era typically applies to US auto production, the sudden shift from thirsty, inefficient, powerful engines to much weaker and detuned but more fuel efficient powerhouses in the early 70s. This led to downgrades in many a great American muscle car, infamously the shift from the iconic and beautiful first generation Mustang into the inconsolably disappointing Mustang II. But I'd argue that the Malays era, where cars are being pulled back down to earth in the name of saving costs and lowering emissions as a result of the gas crisis, can be applicable everywhere else too. For example, the UK, which was suffering from the oil crisis just like their Yankee cousins. Now that brings us to the other ingredient in this equation, British Leyland. Looking back, BL doesn't have the greatest reputations of all the classic car manufacturers. Typically their creations are seen as ugly, unreliable and, well, just sort of terrible in every way. Now it may not have been so bad in the 60s, but as the 70s rolled around, something called a crash program was introduced, with upper management wanting to design and release models as quickly as possible to keep up with rivals like Ford, who, let's face it, were killing it in the UK compared to BL. And this is where the Austin Allegro found its start. After a merger in the late 60s, it was found that there were no plans to replace the very popular yet quickly aging Austin 1100 and 1300 ranges, a valuable sector of the market that BL wanted to hold on to. And so the Allegro project was born, and for nine years between 1973 and 1982, it terrorised the car dealerships across the UK with its disgusting looks. So, yeah, let's talk about that appearance. Now, sure, BL have produced some lookers over the years, but the Allegro really isn't one of them. Apparently, this final appearance is nowhere near what the designers originally wanted. Sleek, sharp edges and panels were becoming more mainstream and stylish, but the Allegro chose to go directly against that. The princess was originally to be taken as a design study to incorporate a number of styling cues seen on it. However, management wanted to install the A and E series engines and a number of other fattening components into the Allegro, not to mention the need for using the BL parts bin. Therefore, a sleek appearance simply wouldn't be possible. So, as design phase quickly moved from idea to idea, the car steadily got fatter and fatter. However, BL, being BL, didn't really care about appearances. In fact, they even said that the Allegro would end up being quote-unquote timeless. Um, and all I can really say to that is, I want what they were smoking. For some specifics, these square headlights look atrocious, anything but timeless, the rear end reminds me of a 205 T16 after a midlife crisis, and don't get me started on the colours. BL was never on the market for either flashy or subdued colours, they primarily sat in the middle with muddy, dull browns, yellows and greens, which really helped in creating a depressive image that admittedly was reflective of Britain in the 1970s. However, easily one of the worst blunders that the Allegro presented us with was a square steering wheel. Yes, you heard me correctly, square. Apparently, this thing was implemented as a necessity rather than a creative choice in order for the driver to see the dials. I mean, personally, if I was in this designer's position, I'd probably try moving the dials themselves before even remotely considering the possibility of literally reinventing the wheel. Luckily, a quote-unquote facelift in 1975 reverted the Allegro back to the more conventional round steering wheel. 
But it's not like appearances were the Allegro's only downfall, oh no. Let's steer, pun intended, away from the looks and examine some of the other faults in these things. For one thing, the Allegro was part of a duo of some sort, the other half being the Morris Marina. Basically, BL wanted to launch these two cars to capture two segments of the market. The Marina would be the straight talker, no real bells and whistles and no innovation to speak of to be a quote-unquote Ford fighter. The Allegro, on the other hand, was to be the more technologically advanced and innovative one. So, while the Marina was quickly designed and shoved into production for 1971, the Allegro was to sit and stew for just a while longer. Were these innovations worth it? Well, you can probably guess. For example, the suspension. As opposed to using the traditional springs, the Allegro was instead fitted with a radical new design called Hydrogas, a fluid-filled design that was supposedly much more space efficient and saw the suspension be connected from the front to the rear. In many ways, it was similar to what Citroen were fitting to their cars at the time, though in BL fashion, Hydrogas was to be much less complicated and most importantly, less expensive. While it was something slightly different and innovative, in the end the Allegro suffered, especially the early models. Another point of contention would be the aforementioned engines. The car was to be powered by the E-Series, but it was also fitted in many guises with the A-Series, both with 1.5 litre and 1.7 litre displacements. While there had been a special production line set up previously for these engines, the engines themselves were never going to blow anyone away, the 1.5 litre only making 69 horsepower, while the 1.7 made a slightly more fiery 76 horsepower. In fact, the highest power that Allegro would ever produce would be from the twin carburetted in line 4 produced from 1974 with a blistering 90 horsepower. There were other reported problems too, such as a lack of rear legroom, vague and difficult gear changes, and a surprising number of reportedly poor brakes. However, we'll be fair, the Allegro wasn't a complete failure from a design point of view. For example, bad press really did hurt this car where it was actually doing rather well. Rust is a prime example. In an interview conducted with workers at the plant at the time, it was said that the Allegro suffered from rust problems, especially on its rear subframe. However, it was found out later on, after the report had been published, that the workers thought the question was referring to the Austin 1100 and 1300 series, which had already ended production. The Allegro actually did have some sound rust proofing, however the reputation had already been lambasted by the media in this regard and so the Allegro would live out its life wrongfully being known as BL's little rust baby. Therefore, when the Allegro launched in May of 1973, its reputation was already shot to pieces. However, variations did appear throughout the years to bolster the range. In 1975, the Vanden Plas was introduced as an upmarket take on the car, with a striking design and a grille I can really only consider as disgusting. Also in 1975, an estate was launched. Now, I am a guy who loves estates and is really crying inside seeing them being killed off by SUVs and crossovers. But this, well, <laughs> this gives me a very great cause to never want to see an estate again. This thing is ugly with a capital U. I think it's something about a three door estate that just doesn't sit right with me. There would also be updates to the base Allegro launched over the lifespan. The Allegro 2 came in 1975 with revised appearances and the quiet demise of the Quartic steering wheel, and the Allegro 3 came in 1979 with further revisions both visually and mechanically. However, despite some terrible press and a pretty badly built car, the Allegro actually sold relatively well, managing to keep up with the likes of the Ford Cortina and its running mate, the Morris Marina. In 1979, for example, it was reported as the fifth best-selling car in the UK six whole years after its initial launch. However, even with revision throughout the years, as the 1980s rolled around, the Allegro quickly fell off the sales chart and it was decided that a replacement was needed. Presenting the Austin Maestro, launched in 1982 as a direct successor to the Allegro, and to be honest, I think this evolution was a good one. I mean, based on just appearances, the Maestro somehow makes the Allegro look even worse. 
Despite having so much wrong with it, I can't help but feel a little sorry for the Allegro. Sure, the final product is nothing short of terrible, but there really was an idea and passion behind this thing in the initial stages. Innovation was the driving force here, and while there were a few bits that managed to slip through the cracks that BL management were trying to cover up, the overall Allegro just screams disappointment. However, if you've seen Jeremy Clarkson's video on which is worse, the Allegro or the Marina, you'll know that in the end he chose the Marina as the bottom dog. And you know what, I find myself agreeing with him. At least the Allegro tried to do something different, the Marina really is as beige a car as you can get. Though I will admit, if you're going to pit two 70s BL motors against literally any other car, well, they're both not going to see anything other than the bottom of the barrel. Thank you so much for watching, with a very special thanks to Ben Wright and Bryn Palmer, who are very generously donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. Just £1 a month is an amazing help. Again, thank you for watching, and take care.